Greetings. My name is William Swing, and it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this webinar. Every month of every year, a very unlikely group of people gather from around the world. We have no budget, no office, no officers, no board of directors, but we have a burning passion to see that the nuclear weapons of this world are dismantled. We call ourselves voices. Our year begins on this day, August the 6th, and ends this day, August the 6th, because we are convinced that if things continue the way they are, not only will we have the first coming of the nuclear bombs on August the 6th, but later on, we will have the final second coming of the dropping of the nuclear weapons. And at that time, all the species of this world will disappear, including our own, unless people rise up and give their voices and follow their voices into action to make sure that we get rid of these weapons. Since our last August the 6th, uh, we of uh, Voices have grown up a lot. We have a new website, which is terrific. We have a new newsletter, which is terrific. And beyond that, and brand new, we have created three videos for young people, which we will show you in a minute. And I hope you enjoy them. And I hope they get to the hearts and minds and imaginations of young people. Obviously, today is the day that we give the second annual Mikhail Gorbachev, George Schultz Voices Youth Award. And that winner will be announced in a couple of minutes. So we've got a, a good day ahead of us. Now to start, I'd like to turn to my friend, who uh, worked at uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab in the University of California, uh, Carolyn McKenzie, to take it from here. Carolyn. Thank you, Bishop Swing. Um, I'm excited to be here as well on this anniversary. Um, you know, a nuclear weapon was last used in 1945, which is, seems like such a long time ago, yet the world still possesses 14,000 nuclear weapons and many are still on high alert. Um, we created, sorry, we created three videos for the purpose of educating youth, young adults and the public on the present day use of the dangers of nuclear weapons. We worked with psychologists on the um, content to make sure it was age appropriate uh, and conveyed compassion in a manner that anyone can understand. The videos are not intended to scare people, but to teach them about solving our problems with discussion and diplomacy instead of force. It was my hope that we presented technically accurate folk, uh, facts uh, instead of uh, uh, hearsay about nuclear weapons and to, in an easy to understand format. Many people today know very little about nuclear weapons because it has been so long since one has been used. And so they're unaware of the threat that they pose to all life. So it's my hope today that by educating youth and the public, um, that we create a new groundswell of support for freeing the world of nuclear weapons. I was just delighted to work with the team of uh, Julie Schelling and Vicki Garlock and Charles Barker and Isaac Thomas and uh, uh, Vincent Long uh, on this effort. Um, this was just a lot of fun. And, um, and, you know, it was a lot of work, a lot of hard work. Uh, but Vicki is a good one to help uh, describe for you uh, our first two youngest videos for our youngest group. Videos, the, um, Vicki is the founder of Faith Seeker K-12 
kids, which focuses on religious literacy for elementary and middle school kids. Um, she has her doctorate in cognitive development and is an ordained minister. So she's very qualified to have been on this panel and to help us and is the author of several interfaith books designed for school-aged uh, children. So Vicki, please talk to us about our first two um, videos for young children. Sure, thank you, Carolyn. So the first video you're gonna see is our Captain No Nukes video. It actually began with a rather tedious search of currently available resources for kids under the age of 10. We found various peace-related resources, but there was almost nothing for kids in this age group that focused specifically on nuclear weapons. Fairly early on, we made two decisions about what we wanted. First, we wanted to keep peace building front and center. And second, we wanted to incorporate some sort of superhero figure that kids could relate to. We then conducted an international poll to determine which figure the kids liked best and the dog won. The next step was to work with an illustrator to create Captain No Nukes, our peaceful superhero who flies all over the globe, working with kids from around the world to eliminate nuclear weapons. As you will see, we start with the idea of peace, then we bring in some age appropriate information about the negative impacts of nuclear weapons. And finally, we end with ways kids can help Captain No Nukes in his quest. We hope you enjoy. Mimi? Hello kids, my name is Captain No Nukes. I am a superhero using all my special dog skills to make our world a safer and more peaceful place. I use my super speed to fly all over the planet and stop conflicts wherever I find them. I love to work with kids from all over the world to teach them about the importance of peace. My biggest job is getting rid of nuclear weapons, the most dangerous weapons on Earth. Most of the time, humans get along with one another, which is really important. Living in harmony is essential for our survival. Positive actions, like being kind, helping others, and taking care of the environment spread from one person to the next. Eventually, those effects can be felt all over the world. That means all of you, in your own way, are superheroes too. Bringing peace to the world is so important. We even give awards for it. Over 50 peace awards are given every year, including the Nobel Peace Prize, the Student Peace Prize, and the Voices Youth Award, which is given to young people who help me get rid of nuclear weapons. Sometimes, however, wars can happen. Wars affect everyone. Kids can't play outside or go to school. Families sometimes have to leave their homes, and when other countries try to help, they get dragged into the war too. It's also difficult to end a war because sometimes no one wants to stop fighting first. Long ago, people fought wars with simple weapons like rocks or knives. Then came guns and bombs. Then people figured out how to unleash the power of teeny tiny particles called atoms to make the most dangerous weapon of all, a nuclear bomb. In 1945, during World War II, nuclear bombs were dropped on two cities in Japan. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They caused the most terrible devastation the world had ever seen. Nuclear bombs pollute the earth and make it unsafe to live where the explosion has happened. And that's where you and I come in. Life is full of challenges, but sometimes we can avoid unpleasant things by making smarter choices. Humans chose to invent nuclear weapons so we can also choose to get rid of them. Many people are already working with me now we need you. Create an art for peace project, like a peace quilt, peace cranes, or a peace sculpture made from recycled materials. Write a letter to your government asking them to work towards banning nuclear weapons around the world and support peace. Let's all use our superpowers to create a world free of nuclear weapons. For more information, www.voices-uri.org. Email contact at voices-uri.org. All right. Um, our second video is uh, short and sweet. 
It's only one minute long and includes only visuals, but it offers a powerful lesson. The video explores how weapons have evolved over the centuries, from natural objects that cause relatively little harm to today's nuclear weapons that are horrifically destructive to all of life. Of course, the final message is that there are better nonviolent ways to solve our problems. All right, thanks for watching those. And next up, we have Charles Barker, a physician, the founder of Compassionate Dallas Fort Worth, and a board member for the International Charter for Compassion. He's going to share yet another resource that Voice has created a crash course on the threat of nuclear weapons. Charles? Thank, thank you, Vicki. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I've been a physician for 50 years and dedicated, committed. Uh, to the health and well-being of everyone uh, under my care. At this moment, it's, it's not hard for me to imagine the devastation, the destruction, the suffering, the pain, and death that could occur with the unleashing of nuclear weapons. Um, I'm convinced uh, that education of our young people and the general public um, on the threat of nuclear weapons is critical, hoping in this educational process that our youth now and in the future will rise up and work towards a world free of nuclear weapons with its uh, reduction as well as elimination. As I looked around for the optimal uh, educational tool uh, for this task, I came across a series of crash courses on YouTube. These are brief, rapid, uh, fire videos uh, where a great deal of information, basic information is presented or crammed in uh, just a few minutes. But nuclear weapons, um, such a complex subject, could it be, could that knowledge um, be crammed into a 10 minute video? Well, a group of us, um, dedicated, committed uh, voices, a team uh, came together and uh, did the work and produced uh, what you will now see, a world free of nuclear weapons, a call to action. So let's take a look at it. On August 6, 1945, the US dropped Little Boy, a nuclear weapon on the city of Hiroshima, Japan. On August 9, 1945, a second nuclear weapon, Fat Man, was dropped on the city of Nagasaki, Japan. The two bombings killed greater than 200,000 people, most of whom were civilians, and World War II ended shortly thereafter. The Weapons have changed over the years. In the beginning, humans warred with simple things, like rocks, wooden clubs, and stone knives as weapons. Then later, guns and bombs. In 1945, scientists unleashed the nuclear power of atoms by creating a nuclear weapon. A nuclear weapon, also called an atomic bomb, nuclear warhead, nuclear bomb, or a weapon of mass destruction, or nuke, is an explosive device containing radioactivity 
that is designed to release high-energy radiation in an exceptionally large explosion by merging or splitting atoms. The two nuclear weapons dropped on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had an explosive yield of the equivalent of 15 to 20 kilotons of TNT. Many of today's nuclear bombs are more deadly, having explosive yields of the equivalent of 1,000 kilotons of TNT. Nine countries, Russia, United States, China, France, United Kingdom, Pakistan, India, Israel, North Korea, possess and store a total of roughly 14,000 nuclear weapons. Russia and the United States possess roughly 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, with approximately 6,000 weapons each. A nuclear bomb, when exploded, releases huge amounts of radioactivity into the environment which cannot be seen. The only way we can detect it is with a special instrument such as a Geiger counter. When energy from radioactivity is present in the air, it is called radiation. The yellow and black propeller symbol, called the trefoil, is used to denote the presence of radiation. Used judiciously, radiation can be helpful. For example, it is used for X-ray studies in medicine to diagnose a broken bone or treat cancer. What are the effects of a nuclear explosion? Nuclear weapons have an exceptionally large explosive blast, destroying everything in its immediate radius for several miles. Radioactive material is sent into the sky and then rains down on the Earth as radioactive contamination, also called fallout radiation. This fallout radiation contaminates the Earth so that people cannot live in those areas for an indefinite period of time. The bomb's immediate effects on the area of a nuclear bomb blast for those who survive the initial explosion, depending on the amount of radiation exposure received, will experience health effects such as changes to the blood cells, nausea, vomiting, burns to the skin, hair loss, sterilization, and eventual death can occur within hours to days to weeks following the exposure. The bomb's long-term effects are predominantly an increased risk of cancer. Things can go wrong with possessing and storing nuclear weapons. There could be intentional use. Political leaders could intentionally respond inappropriately to a perceived threat with the use of nuclear weapons or escalate a conflict by using nuclear weapons. Nuclear missiles have almost been launched by mistake before. An accident could happen. The term broken arrow is used to describe any incident in which a nuclear weapon is lost, stolen, or mistakenly detonated. The U.S. has experienced more than 30 broken arrows incidents the U.S. and Russia have lost approximately 24 nuclear weapons at sea. A weapon could be stolen or misfired. Nuclear weapons are stored securely, but there is always concern that a terrorist organization might attempt to steal one of these weapons for their own intentions. Modern nuclear launch technology is based on using computer servers, software, and codes, but a technological glitch or hacking of software is always a concern. Nuclear weapon accidents have occurred. The probability of these accidents is too high for comfort. Money spent on the nuclear weapons arsenal could be spent better. A collective $72.9 billion was spent on nuclear weapons by the world's nuclear armed nations in 2019, according to a report by the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN. Even more is spent to maintain an old decaying nuclear arsenal infrastructure. This money could be used instead to help relieve hunger, poverty, fight climate change, and address other global health issues. A nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Joint Soviet-United States Statement, Geneva Summit Meeting, 1985. Nuclear weapons pose unacceptable risks to humanity and the environment. Most countries in the world have rejected the idea of owning nuclear weapons. They recognize that nuclear weapons make them less safe, not more secure. Nuclear disarmament, which is the task of reducing and abolishing nuclear weapons, is the goal. Human survival requires settling our differences peacefully. Conventional weapons have always inflicted terrible damage, but it wasn't until 1945, when nuclear weapons were developed, that the ability to wipe humanity off the face of Earth became a possibility. It is clear that our greatest potential for survival can only be achieved when we learn to live in peace.
both with one another and with the earth. We are interconnected and interdependent on each other. There are almost 8 billion people living on our planet. You cannot take an action that does not affect others, such as throwing plastic bottles and debris into the ocean will pollute and negatively affect the shores of another country. Yet, if we can show acts of kindness to people, we can inspire others to do the same, spreading kindness far and wide. As Albert Einstein stated, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. There are international agreements between countries about the use of nuclear weapons to promote global peace. Diplomacy has yielded a number of international agreements. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, or CTBT, bans testing. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW, bans all nuclear weapons. The Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, START, limits nuclear weapon use. And the Non-Proliferation Treaty, NPT, bans further production. But not all countries have agreed to these treaties. The Golden Rule is found in each of the world's major faith traditions. It is the guiding principle for all human action. More and more youth are speaking out based on their ethical and faith journey for abolition of nuclear weapons. Peace is key to our human survival. Understanding this, we honor each year those who are most successful at promoting peace with a number of special awards. The Nobel Peace Prize, the World Peace Prize, the Student Peace Prize, and even an International Children's Peace Prize. Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons presents a Youth Award for Nuclear Disarmament each year in honor of the nuclear abolition legacy of former USSR President Mikhail Gorbachev and former U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz. In 2020, the award went to Kekishan Basu, a youth activist, founder and president of Green Hope Foundation, a champion with United Nations Human Rights, and winner of the 2016 International Children's Peace Prize. Here is what you can do to help, as stated in the Hiroshima-Nagasaki Accord. If you are young, demand urgent governmental action before these weapons rob you and your children of a future. If you are a diplomat, keep pounding away on the fulfillment of legal commitments already contained in treaties in force that calls for the reduction and elimination of the threat posed by these weapons. If you are a religious leader, pray, preach, prophesy to stop the nuclear end of the world. If you are not informed on these matters, become educated, subscribe to a nuclear newsletter, and wake up. If you are a politician, join parliamentarians and leaders worldwide who are working to stop the modernization and expansion of the capacity of nuclear weapons in quality and quantity and advance policies and legislation that reduces the threat of the use of weapons, stops their spread and leads to their elimination. If you are a citizen, join a nuclear weapons abolition group, march in the streets, write letters, pray fervently, and demand institutions stop investing in the nuclear weapon industry. If you are a scientist, don't be used by politicians who champion nuclear stockpiles. Find solidarity in your ranks and reach across national boundaries to scientists in other countries. If you are an environmentalist, recognize that nuclear weapons are the immediate and ultimate threat to climate change. And if you are in a nation armed with nuclear weapons, join the other nuclear nations to establish a joint enterprise committed to working for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Let us finish what past generations aspired to create, a world free of nuclear weapons. For more information, visit our website www.voices-uri.org or email contact at voices-uri.org. Thank you. Um, uh, a pretty powerful video. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce um, Marilyn Turkovich. Uh, Marilyn is uh, 
the executive director for the Charter for Compassion, and she is an educator par excellence. So Marilyn, I'll turn things over to you. Great, thank you, Charlie. I want to share my screen because at the beginning of the session today, um, Bishop Swing indicated, and I'm hoping that there we go, that you'll see my screen, that we have um, a great new website. And part of that great new website obviously is three of the videos that you've just seen. And if you go across the navigation bar, uh, you're going to find that the videos are available to you there. Uh, and there are other youth resources. The other thing that is so great about this website is it's becoming an archive. And it's an archive of both written word, uh, and I'll, I'll just do one of these. And in addition to the, the written word, um, there is also a great filmography. And not only is the filmography great uh, in terms of listing and letting you know about the availability of films, the other thing that is fantastic about it is that you have a link to these films so that you can go forth and watch them, include them in organizational meetings, uh, and as at the same time, uh, be able to, to use them so that um, you can use them in classrooms as well as uh, in, in other places as well. So I thought I would just share that with you. And then at the same time, I'm going to now turn this back uh, to Bishop Swing so we can move on to, to the main part of, of what we're doing. Thank you. And I know I need to stop sharing my screen and I'm having some difficulty <laughs> doing that. So, um, so Bishop Swing, if you could just, um, you know, maybe the best thing for me to do is to try and there we go. Thank you, Mimi. I'm sure you had something to do with that. Uh, so okay, turn it over to you. Good, thank you so much. Uh, Marilyn, uh, we, uh, now that we've shown the, the three, is there anything that uh, Vicki, uh, Charles, uh, Carolyn, is there anything you'd like to say at the end of having seen those three together, you worked on them differently. Is there any, any last comment you'd like to make? Well, I'd just like to say that we um, hope that these actually start being used in schools. Um, and so to the extent, of course, you know, parents, caregivers, grandparents would love for you to show them. But if you know teachers that are interested in this issue um, and who are willing to um, start exploring the, this issue with kids, please send them to these videos because that's where you really get sort of a captive audience and, um, and reach a lot of people. I would add, add to that, Vicki, that um, as a board member for the Charter for Compassion, who's one of its major missions is uh, uh, compassion cultivation, education and training from cradle to the grave. I think that these, these videos really uh, lend themselves to um, being viewed at all, all levels uh, of our kids all the way to our older adults. Yes, I would say, please share them far and wide. Um, we're, we're just really wanting to get them out to the public um, for anyone and everyone to see. Thank you. Great, great. Um, there are two parts to our webinar today. One is the uh, three uh, videos and the other part is announcing the winner of um, the second annual Mikhail Gorbachev, George Schultz, uh, Voices uh, Youth Award. And uh, to, to say, to announce the winner and to say a little bit of background, I'd like to turn to a friend of mine, a young friend of mine from uh, the southern part of India, uh, Kerala, India, uh, Isaac Thomas. Isaac, we're in your hands. Thank you. Thank you, dear Bishop. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yep. So this is an auspicious occasion for our Voices community. Uh, our purpose here is to assist in the effort to abolish nuclear weapons through peace building and conflict transformation. 
We have emerged in the past few years as a global movement, especially as an inclusive and intergenerational platform for passionate minds. The Voices Youth Award is given to those who have been part of exemplary programs or actions to engage youth in the local, regional, or global movement to abolish nuclear weapons. The award honors the legacy of former USSR President Mikhail Gorbachev and late former United States Secretary of State George Shultz in their efforts for nuclear disarmament. Last year, the first award was presented to Rekeshan Basu, and this year we got many nominations and the Voices Selection Committee did have a tough time to evaluate and select, and we believe we have made the right decision. For Voices, this award is our dream, this is our action, and this is our hope for the present and future generations who strive to create a world free of nuclear weapons. So without further ado, with the permission of all the Voices members and community, it's my privilege and honor to announce the second annual Voices Youth Award to 2021 winner, Sahil V. Shah from the European Leadership Network and CT Video Youth Group. Congratulations, Sahil. Few words about our winner. Sahil Shah is a visionary focused on nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament who worked personally with US Secretaries George Schultz and William J. Perry. He is now based at the European Leadership Network, where he leads their work on protecting the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and other nuclear risk reduction activities, such as the new START Treaty extension. His work has been featured in international media, and he is also a commentator on nuclear issues. He was the key founding member of the CTBTO Youth Group, which had its fifth anniversary and surpassed 1,000 members. He has worked tirelessly to make sure that young people are given a seat at the table on issues which are normally left in the purview of the upper echelons of government. At his young age, he has broken cycles and ceilings, showing that youth have meaningful contributions to make in the nuclear security field. Once again, congratulations, dear Sahil, for this achievement. I take this opportunity to welcome you to the Voices community and offer our best wishes and support for all your future endeavors. To all our nominees this year, hats off to the great work that each and every one of you are doing all around the world. We welcome you too to the Voices community and extend our action platforms so that we can achieve our common dream of a world free of nuclear weapons. Now, officially, I would like to invite our Voices CC founder, Bishop William Swing, to once again show us the 2021 Voices Youth Award, which will be later presented to Sahil, dear Bishop. Okay, here it is. Uh, the, the gold leaf is a ginkgo leaf. Uh, it comes from the Japanese tea garden in San Francisco, but before that it came from Japan, from Hiroshima. One of the few trees that made it through the bombing. And so this is a heritage that comes from Japan, from the first atomic bomb, from uh, George Schultz, from the Japanese Tea Garden, to us, to Sahil. And it says in the, in the front, in honor of the nuclear abolition legacy of President Mikhail Gorbachev, USSR, and Secretary of State George Schultz, USA. And I've tried very hard, uh, Sahil, to reach through the computer to get it to you, but I'm just gonna to have to send it to you in London. Uh, but congratulations to you, well-deserved. And we'd love to hear from you now, if you could say some, some words to us. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Swain and the rest of the United Religions Initiative team for having me today and Isaac for the kind introduction. I'm really moved to be presented with an award that is in the namesake of such inspiring individuals, President Mikhail Gorbachev and Secretary George Shultz, who were truly diplomatic titans of their era and continue to inspire many that a nuclear weapons free world is a goal and reality that can and should be achieved. Um, if diplomacy was a sport, they would be as awarded as the United States Simone Biles or the Soviet Union's Larissa Latinina, both now tied in Olympic and uh, world medals for their craft. 
Um, I'm grateful that they created this honor together to recognize young talent and really look forward to connecting with the first recipient, future recipients, and forming an actual community. Um, when I was 18 years old, I had the pleasure of meeting Secretary Schultz for the first time after being introduced to him by Secretary William J. Perry. Um, before I could even grasp the magnitude of his presence, he began telling a story. Over the years, this became a very familiar experience for those who had the pleasure of being able to spend time with him. He imparted knowledge through his remarkable life experiences in a way that really resonated with your soul. He would speak at length on the importance of the strength of purpose, emphasizing that one should never underestimate the power of small acts of kindness and bridge building, and that relationships built on trust and respect are integral to success. As a soldier who had friends in arms killed next to him in battle, he had a deep awareness of the generational trauma of conflict. When he was US Secretary of Treasury, Secretary Schultz went on a spontaneous trip to Leningrad with the then Soviet Minister of Foreign Trade, Nikolai Patilochev, and after a routine meeting in Moscow. Secretary Schultz would often recount how the minister took him to Leningrad Cemetery, where they walked down the center aisle as funeral music played in the background. Tears were streaming down the minister's face as he described the toll that the Second World War had on practically every family in the Soviet Union. When they returned to the platform overlooking the cemetery, Secretary Schultz did what he considered any decent Marine or American you know, should do. He faced the mass graves of over half a million lost souls, stood tall with his arms by his side, and he honored them with a long salute. Even years later, when he was negotiating nuclear arms control with the Soviets, many people mentioned this story, and he always said that the lesson was to never hesitate to give respect where it is due. It is this image of Secretary Schultz that will be emblazoned in my mind as we carry forward his legacy in particular. He lived unapologetically in pursuit of bold visions for what we can achieve through dialogue. While he always saw strength as a key component to success, Trust born out of respect, empathy, and friendship was really the coin of the realm, an idea he touched upon in his last op-ed before passing away at the remarkable age of 100, as sharp as ever, earlier this year. Today, which marks the 76th anniversary of the US atomic bombing of Hiroshima, is a somber occasion for many reasons. In particular, the context in which both this and last year's commemoration is occurring is a planet riddled with continued consequences posed by the global pandemic. The world is quite simply embroiled in mass suffering with various dimensions of the global geometry of inequality on full display. As we strive to pick up the pieces and build back better, it's clear that we all will be weighed down with grief for some time. As Malika Davich Cyril wrote in a beautiful piece recently, all social justice and human rights work is a collective, collective act of glorified mourning. To have a movement that breathes, you must build a movement with the capacity to grieve. I could not help but to think of the hibakusha, the Japanese term for those affected by the US atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki three days later when reading that quote. They have fought tirelessly for over, for over seven decades now to raise awareness of why nuclear weapons should have no place in our world, while also in a state of perpetual grieving. As they grow old, their average age now almost reaching 85, Many feel an extreme urgency. The question remains how to educate the world of the immense nuclear risks that continue to remain and grow in many ways due to the complex relationships between now nine nuclear weapon states in existence today. If I were to have one suggestion, it would be that we must think critically about not only who speaks on these issues, but also who is heard on them. I'm very thankful to Rethink Media for allowing me to share some statistics very briefly that have not been made public yet. In looking at a representative sample of all US media coverage on nuclear weapons issues so far in 2021, Rethink Media found that 80%, 86% of the sources quoted were men and just 14% were women. Zeroing in on quotes from members of the disarmament and arms control community, the numbers improved slightly. Quotes are 69% men and 31% women for 2021, with 28% of the quotes coming from individuals of color, while 72 came from white speakers. And of the total quotes from the disarmament and arms control community in US media from 2018 to 2021, 7% were from women of color, 
15% from men of color, 16% from white women, and 62% from white men. It's very obvious that gender and race play a large role in who gets to shape and speak on nuclear weapons, but so does geography. Nuclear weapon states have relegated the trauma tied to nuclear weapons often to the margins and peripheries of their own countries and also the world. For example, this year marks the 25th anniversary of the nuclear test ban treaty, the CTBT, which still awaits entry into force. If you were to aggregate and put together all of the atmospheric testing done alone and its yield, it would be the equivalent of exploding two Hiroshima bombs, Hiroshima sized bombs every day in open air for 35 years straight. The words of a 20 year old Fijian military officer present for the British nuclear tests conducted off the shore of Kirimati and then called Christmas Island have always stuck with me. He said, we went to Christmas Island and when we got there, we found out, they told us, that they were going to test nuclear weapons. We didn't even know what a nuclear weapon was. There was no word for nuclear in the Fijian language. There was no word for radiation. We didn't know what it was until we were told to follow orders and they tested them. This quote reminds me of when Audrey Lord asked, what are the words you do not yet have? What do you need to say? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them still in silence. We must reframe how people think and talk about nuclear weapons. We must elevate more diverse voices, especially young people and those who have seen, heard, and felt the generational suffering and trauma associated with the use of these weapons, not only in Japan, but around the world. I'm consistently impressed by the level of young talent contributing to our community but we need to make sure that their ideas are heard. I would also in closing like to thank my family, friends and colleagues for their undying support. I'm really proud to be a first generation American and British citizen whose parents and grandparents um, are not from the West. Uh, my grandparents grew up in the humble villages of Gujarat, India, and my parents grew up in Neri, a rural town on the foothills of Mount Kenya and Kericho, a small town nestled in the rolling emerald highlands of the tea plantations in Kenya. Uh, my family has worked immensely hard for me to have the opportunities I have today, traveling continent to continent, to continent taking risk to risk. And in the words of Naomi Osaka, um, I would like to thank my ancestors because every time I remember that their blood runs through my veins, I'm reminded that I cannot lose. So the greatest award to me is being their son and grandson because they've given me a voice. We're here under the Voices for a World Free, uh, Free of Nuclear Weapons. They've given me a voice that has been shaped by all of their experiences. And I hope to continue to use it to make the world a better, more equitable and safer place. So thank you again for this honor and to URI for all the excellent work you're doing, especially to uh, educate young people on nuclear weapons issues. Thank you. Thank you, Sahil. My goodness gracious, that's wonderful. We are deeply touched by your words and your witness uh, to your family, uh, to your uh, uh, total commitment to nuclear disarmament. And we're so proud to be uh, with you and part of you and to have you part of us. We look forward to uh, years ahead working together. Um, it's, it's uh, time for us to close. Before closing, I wanna thank everybody whose picture is on the air, but the, the person who's never spoken is the person who's done the most work, and that's Julie Schelling. Uh, she is the heartbeat and the person who just makes it happen, makes it happen every day. And the rest of us come and go, uh, but she quietly uh, holds it all together and uh, keeps it moving forward. So Julie, thank you, thank you for all you do and uh, for uh, holding us together. Thank you all for watching, whoever's watching. I hope a lot of you are out there and we'll be back. Uh, we're consistent. We're gonna be back uh, next August the 6th and uh, we're gonna have another great winter and I uh, look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, uh, uh, wherever you are, uh, choose life, uh, get rid of the bombs, uh, help the world become free and alive. Thank you very much. <laughs>